So good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to start this instruction course uh, 265, and uh, this is titled "Role of Ocular Perfusion Pressure in Glaucoma." So we have uh, excellent talks lined up in this session. Uh, after introduction by me, uh, we have a talk on the concept of ocular perfusion pressure by Dr. Kiran Bhanot, glaucoma trials and studies in favor of role of ocular perfusion pressure. Then Dr. Vineet Sagal is going to give us evidence in favor of role of ocular perfusion pressure. Dr. NZ Faruqi is going to elaborate on instruments, various instruments to evaluate ocular blood flow. And this will be rounded up with the last talk on triple drug fixed dose combination in glaucoma management. So we start this session. So this is new kid on the block in ocular perfusion, the entity called ocular perfusion pressure. We all know that glaucoma is a progressive optic neuropathy of unknown origin, and traditionally diagnosis and treatment has been directed towards the control of increased intraocular pressure, which is the single most important, modifiable, treatable risk factor. But some glaucoma patients continue to progress despite the medical lowering of intraocular pressure or at IOP in the low teens in normotensive glaucoma. Various trials and studies like OSTS, EMGT, CNTGS, AGIS, and stitch tests all have demonstrated that in a significant number of the patients, visual field deterioration continues despite IOP control by medical or surgical management. So glaucoma is a complex disease that cannot be controlled by only IOP reducing therapies in all the patients. So glaucoma represents a spectrum where mechanical damage causes damage at high intraocular pressure and vascular factors cause damage at lower intraocular pressure levels. But both these factors are interrelated as increase in IOP decreases the blood flow to the optic nerve head and vice versa. And 60% of the glaucoma patients, they have vascular insufficiencies. So managing IOP alone may not be sufficient to control the progression. There is need to manage ocular perfusion pressure also. Way back in 1922, Felix Legrand said that glaucomatous eye is a sick eye in a sick body. And these are the 1800, Von Graffe recognized the presence of glaucoma is not related to intraocular pressure. And Smith suggested involvement of both mechanical and vascular factors. And these are, if you classify non-vascular and vascular factors, non-vascular factors are IOP and IOP fluctuation. And the vascular factors are systemic comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, migraine, disc hemorrhage, systemic hypertension, and lower ocular perfusion pressure. How does aging causes uh, decrease perfusion pressure? Aging cause decrease in the choroidal thickness, which lead to decrease in the ocular blood flow. 47% of the glaucoma patients also have hypertension, and there is decreased ocular blood flow because of chronic stage, small blood vessels damage, and even antihypertensive treatment may cause nocturnal hypertension, leading to decreased ocular perfusion pressure. Migraine causes uh, decreased uh, perfusion pressure by elevated level of endothelin and 30% of glaucoma patients also have diabetes and the vascular damage leads to uh, uh, decreased perfusion pressure. So in glaucoma patients, decreased blood flow has been reported to occur not only in the optic nerve but also in the retina, choroid, retrovulbar vessels, brain and the peripheral vascular system. So primary insult appears to happen at the optic nerve head, increase IOP and ischemia at the post laminar O ONH, they affect the retinal ganglion cell. And secondary insult happen if OPP falls below the lower level of autoregulation, which Dr. Kiran is uh, also going to elaborate on. So there is a great role of vascular uh, dysregulation in uh, uh, glaucoma because this leads to dip, uh, disturbed balancing process between blood pressure and intraocular pressure, leading to decreased per perfusion pressure. And vasospasm may also occur, which may trigger daily episodes of hypoxia, reperfusion injury. So of the various pathogenic mechanisms, it is not only the IOP and IOP, uh, increased IOP and IOP fluctuation, but also reduce ocular perfusion pressure and ocular perfusion pressure fluctuation, which leads to uh, which in association with uh, abnormal autoregulation leads to decreased ocular perfusion pressure. And this is uh, World Glaucoma Association uh, 2009-6 consensus publication which has 
uh, uh, stressed that low OPP has been identified as an independent risk factor for glaucoma progression. But do we have adequate evidence to justify routine assessment of OPP in all our glaucoma patients? Or in other words, is ocular perfusion pressure a modifiable risk factor? But the recent population-based studies have found low OPP to be a risk factor not only for development, but also for progression of glaucoma after reaching the target intraocular pressure. And what is ocular perfusion pressure? Uh, I'll, I'll leave this to Dr. Kiran. And uh, it has been found that low diastolic perfusion pressure, less than 50 millimeter mercury, was associated with OAG prevalence in various epidemiological studies which has been conducted across the globe. An association of BP status with optic disc structure, it has been concluded that lowering not only hypertension but lowering of blood pressure with antihypertensive treatment is associated with increased risk for glaucomatous damage. And these are the various hypotheses. Number one, subjects treated for systemic hypertension experience large reduction of nocturnal BP leading to low OPP. And hypothesis two is antihypertensive treatment disrupts the vessel's natural ability to auto-regulate at any given ocular perfusion pressure. So blood pressure is a major factor which can affect the ocular perfusion pressure and it was said by Wienrep that diastolic BP compared to systolic BP has a greater effect than uh, in calculating the mean ocular perfusion pressure and Greenfield quantified it by saying that 10 millimeter mercury change in systolic blood pressure causes 2.2 millimeter change in mean ocular perfusion pressure and change in diastolic pressure similar change in diastolic blood pressure leads to double that is 4.4 millimeter change in the mean ocular perfusion pressure in persons with normal BP with good auto-regulation, a much greater rise of IOP would be required to compromise, uh, compromise optic nerve head blood flow. But in contrast, in patients with hypotension and defective auto-regulation, even normal intraocular pressure may compromise optic nerve head blood flow as occurs in normotensive glaucoma. Circadium rhythm is also important in ocular perfusion pressure, just like in uh, intraocular pressure and it has been found that OPP fluctuation is also very important. So what are the facts that favor the measurement of ocular perfusion pressure in glaucoma? One, dysfunction of systemic vascular endothelium, normotensive glaucoma patients, there is significant association with the occurrence of asymptomatic MI, NTG has increased variability of nighttime BP measurements, there is importance of oxidative stress factors and mitochondrial function in OAG. OAG has abnormal autoregulatory response. There is documented role of OPP in progression of glaucoma in population-based studies and increasing ocular circulation improves oxidative stress in retinal tissue. And vascular abnormalities in glaucoma extend beyond the eye. The nail fold capillary abnormalities have been detected in POAG in the form of dilated capillaries, avascular zone, CVS disease association is there. There's a positive correlation between renal function that is low glomerular filtration rate and glaucoma and cerebral vasculature deficits have also been demonstrated on MRI in normotensive glaucoma patients. So what are the patient subgroups in which we should definitely consider value of assessing OPP when is eyes with optic disc hemorrhage, patients with progression at low intraocular pressure, history of low BP, multiple systemic antihypertensives and patients with nocturnal hypotension. So while the relationship between ocular blood flow and glaucoma is not well established, nature of that relationship is not well understood. And it's a very tricky variable. Which is more important, IOP alone, BP alone, or combination of both? So time has come to think beyond intraocular pressure. So now I'll request Dr. Kiran to take over as concept of glaucoma is shifting from a disease of single pressure to a disease of multiple pressures. Thank you very Thank much, you, sir. Dr. Panna. Uh, now, uh, the next topic where Dr. Kiran Ma'am would be talking about would be the concept of ocular perfusion pressure. Okay. Good morning, slide. everyone. So, theories for pathogenesis of glaucomatous optic neuropathy, you know, have been mechanical, vascular, and neurogenic. But the existence of normotensive glaucoma cannot be explained by a pressure theory alone. So, there was a new pressure for the glaucoma specialist the ocular perfusion pressure. What is OPP? In its simplest form, it is the relationship between systemic blood pressure and intraocular pressure. Van Jaeger was the first to suggest a vascular etiology for pathogenesis of glaucoma. It attempts to explain on the basis 
of a reduced ocular perfusion pressure, a faulty vascular autoregulation, and loss of neurovascular coupling. OBP is the pressure at which the blood enters the eye and is defined as the difference between the arterial and venous pressure in the eye. As venous pressure in the eye approximates the IOP, IOP can be considered a substitute for the venous pressure. So OPP can be expressed as a difference between arterial blood pressure and intraocular pressure. So the normal blood pressure variation is usually 40 to 60 millimeters in a cardiac cycle, while typical circadian variation in IOP is around 5 to 8 millimeters. So the perfusion pressure changes, but the tissue blood flow should remain stable to maintain metabolic activity. Good perfusion depends on complex regulation process that balances the BP and IOP. Adequate perfusion with sufficient blood is critical to maintain the metabolic and nutritional needs. So by definition, ocular perfusion pressure is defined. It refers to the pressure available to drive blood through the intraocular vasculature, the degree of perfusion being influenced by resistance to flow, which is a function of the vessel caliber or vessel tone. Decrease in OPP and or subsequent ischemia of the optic nerve head could contribute to the glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Decreased OPP is a risk factor for prevalence, incidence, and progression of glaucoma. Death of the retinal ganglion cells is enhanced by the reduced OPP, and abnormal autoregulation and neurovascular coupling may lead to the ganglion cell death. OPP can be defined as the mean OPP, systolic, and diastolic ocular perfusion pressures. What is the mean OPP? It is two-thirds mean arterial pressure minus IOP, where mean arterial pressure is diastolic blood pressure plus one-third systolic BP minus diastolic BP. This two-third accounts for the drop in BP between the brachial and ophthalmic artery when the subject is seated. So systolic ocular perfusion pressure is systemic systolic BP minus IOP, and diastolic ocular perfusion pressure is systemic diastolic BP minus IOP. DOPP is especially useful in displaying the lowest OPP values. So regardless of the calculation method used to define OPP, it is clearly reduced in the presence of low blood pressure, high intraocular pressure, or both. Now because blood pressure is a much greater than IOP, changes in BP affect OPP to a greater extent than changes in IOP. Furthermore, BP and IOP both follow circadian rhythm from day to day within day, daytime, nighttime, and BP within each cardiac cycle. So OPP is therefore highly variable and prone to fluctuation. Now OPP itself includes IOP, so it is possible that some of the findings attributed to o OPP are in fact secondary to IOP. So it is important to check whether the results of a study were adjusted for intraocular pressure, anti-glaucoma, and anti-hypertensive medication. It was observed that adjustment was available in only 57% of our studies. There's a strong association of open, open angle glaucoma was found with the low ocular perfusion pressure, low diastolic blood pressure of less than 60, and a high systolic BP of more than 170. So both extremes of BP spectrum are at a greater risk of glaucoma. So what is the hypothesis? A low diastolic pressure, the patient suffer from low OPP at the optic nerve head. With a high systolic BP, there's a decrease in the vessel diameter and arteriosclerosis, which compromises the vascular autoregulation and impairs nutrient exchange at the optic nerve head. So this hypothesis indicates that low, uh, low OPP can occur secondary to a high intraocular pressure, low or high BP, and atherosclerosis. Now, systolic and diastolic BP declines or dips during sleep between 2 and 4 a.m. due to decrease in sympathetic system activity during sleep, which is a normal physiological dip. Now, there are some patients who are non-dippers if the nocturnal decline is absent or blunted, and some are extreme dippers if the nocturnal fall is greater than 15 to 20 percent. So it was seen that lack of physiological dip may be harmful may result in an impaired microcirculation, possibly associated with excessive free radical production, toxic to neurons or glial cells. Now, 
blood flow is autoregulated to maintain a constant flow despite fluctuations in perfusion pressure. Autoregulation of ocular blood flow is characterized by local vascular constriction or dilatation, causing an increase or decreased vascular resistance, thereby maintaining a constant nutrient supply in response to the perfusion pressure changes. But the relationship between OPP and ocular blood flow is complex. An autoregulation response may differ if the pressure is altered through arterial or venous pathway, particularly due to paucity of smooth muscles in veins. It was seen that abnormal autoregulation occurs in glaucoma in response to acute changes in the ocular perfusion pressure, which could be due to change in body position leading to changes in circulatory system, and short-term rise of IOP leads to reduced retinal vessel reaction in POG patients. So even in the presence of autoregulation, low OPP predisposes for ischemic periods by reducing the range of the autoregulatory reserve. So low systemic BP combined with elevated IOP will reduce the OPP at the optic nerve head, reduce blood flow volume in eyes with an impaired autoregulatory system, leading to ischemic damage to the axons and atrophy of the retinal ganglion cells. Now, OPP is a complex variable that could be affected by multiple factors, and neither BP nor IOP can account entirely for its regulation, like a postural change. IOP increases by three to four millimeters at night in a supine position, and there is increase in the episcleral venous pressure. There's a dynal rhythm both of BP and IOP. Oral antihypertensive medications cause nocturnal hypotension as a combined effect of antihypertensive and natural dynal rhythm. So there is, should be a cautious use of antihypertensive with progressive visual field deterioration despite lio, low IOP is advised. And topical anti-glaucoma medications. Now loss of autoregulation in the ocular blood flow resulted in, it was seen, there was a greater increase in NRR blood flow were observed in POG patients then in ocular hypertensive with similar amount of IOP reduction and MOPP, that is the mean ocular perfusion pressure, correlated positively with end diastolic velocity in the ophthalmic and central retinal artery in progressive glaucoma patients. Such correlations were absent in stable glaucoma patients and healthy controls. Now vascular dysregulation is hypothesized to be involved in at least some cases of glaucoma, especially in normotensive glaucoma. So it could lead not only to chronically low perfusion, but to unstable perfusion with wide fluctuations and repeated ischemic stress, leading to the optic nerve head injury. Vascular dysregulation appears to be an early manifestation in glaucoma, causing a reduced ocular nerve head blood flow, and there's an abnormal association between BP and ocular perfusion which leads to unstable ocular perfusion and thereby to ischemia and reperfusion damage. Reduction in both OPP and ocular blood flow occurs during sleep in the supine position due to combined effects of a rise in IOP and dip of systemic blood pressure. So significantly lower DOPPs were seen in POG patients during the whole night from midnight to 6 a.m. And low nocturnal OPP might result in further damage in glaucoma patient especially when autoregulation is impaired. Now, it was seen there's a circadian MOPP flow, which may be the most important risk factor for glaucoma. In addition to being important in NTG with nocturnal hypertension, it may have a role in development of glaucoma regardless of nocturnal hypertension. Excess free radicals derived from ischemia and reperfusion may contribute to reversible or irreversible manifestations of cell injury. It is hypothesized that chronic, repetitive, circadian, ocular blood flow variations could result in accumulative ischemia and reperfusion effects manifested in the form of RNFL damage, that is, and visual field deterioration. In susceptible individuals, autoregulatory dysfunction allows any fluctuation in OPP via changes in BP or IOP to change retinal and optic nerve head perfusion. Atherosclerosis from prolonged arterial hypertension resulting in inadequate changes in vessel size, reducing reserve available for other challenges to the circulation, inherently abnormal vascular response to autonomic stimulation, local hormones and metabolites. 
A relationship between some atherosclerotic risk factors and OEG has been demonstrated in several studies. Though no study directly visualized the ocular circulation in humans, highlighting the need for additional studies to identify the real influence of atherosclerosis in glaucoma. Now, what is the effect of medications on OPP? The American Heart Association recommends aggressive control of blood pressure less than 130 AT in patients with CAD and much lower in patients with left ventricular dysfunction. So it was seen that aggressive treatment of systemic hypertension was deleterious for glaucoma patients, and several studies suggested the influence of systemic hypertension on glaucoma. Harry noted that patients on topical and systemic beta blockers had greater nocturnal BP dips than other patients. The possibility that overtreatment of cystic hy systemic hypertension could worsen the glaucoma. So a compromised vascular system can also influence glaucoma damage due to inability of the eye to maintain consistent and adequate perfusion during pharmacologically lowered BP in susceptible individuals. Low diastolic blood pressures due to antihypertensive therapy was associated with increased cupping, suggesting low BP and OPP can pre uh, predispose to glaucomatous damage. Now, calcium channel antagonist may increase ocular circulation and protect neuronal cells against retinal neurotoxicity. However, the Rotterdam Eye Study revealed an increased risk of OEG with calcium channel antagonists. These agents decrease BP without affecting IOP, thus reducing OPP. So results suggest caution when using calcium channel antagonists in glaucoma patients. Now, effect of anti-glaucoma medications on OPP are variable. A mean 24-hour systolic BP and diastolic BP was significantly reduced by brimonidine and timolol. The mean 24-hour OPP with latanoprost was significantly increased. Timolol did not possibly due to reduction in BP. And brimonidine induced a significant decrease in the mean 24-hour DOPP. Dorzolamide and latanoprost both induced a significant increase. So to conclude, glaucoma is more than just a disease of single type of description. Some assessment of ocular perfusion pressure also needs to be considered when determining an individual's risk of developing glaucoma or experiencing disease progression. Night time perfusion pressure could be a prediction of glaucoma risk. Systemic antihypertensive medication treatment could affect the risk of developing the disease and or its progression. Now, ocular perfusion pressure is subject to influence by a myriad of factors, and it is measured conventionally as the difference between mean arterial pressure and IOP. OPP has been identified as an important factor in development and progression of glaucoma, especially in NTG, where autoregulation dysfunction has been implicated. An ambulatory 24-hour OPP may assist in efficacy of treatment and assess individual dynal fluctuation. Interdisciplinary treatment of hypertension and glaucoma should be emphasized, and different medications to lower IOP have different effects on OPP. So we are currently aware that not all assumptions regarding vascular theory hold true. Other mechanisms, including those associated with biochemical and genetic theories, indicate several other factors can lead to glaucoma. It is assumed that glaucoma is a multifactorial disorder with multiple mechanisms active in the same patient. Further prospective longitudinal clinical and epidemiological studies should be conducted to conclusively prove the role of vasogenesis in causation of glaucoma and ultimately use that facet of pathogenesis in better management of patients suffering from this condition in a more holistic manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, and now, uh, Bhalla sir would be talking about glaucoma trials and studies in favor of role of ocular perfusion pressure. So we have seen in these studies that uh, definitely, uh, in, as the vascular theory is there, ocular perfusion pressure plays a role in the pathogenesis of glaucoma. Uh, whenever we basically propose a study, it has to be validated with the, with the relevant patients and what we can do in our clinical practice which can basically help the patient to decrease the progression of glaucoma. So sir would be talking about the various trials and studies conducted for this. Uh, thank you. After the uh, beautifully explained concept of ocular perfusion pressure by Dr. Kiran Bharot, 
I'll uh, like to give the evidence. The various trials and studies have been conducted which have favored the role of ocular perfusion pressure in the pathogenesis of glaucoma. So what actually is evidence-based medicine? Previously, it was, the medicine was considered as art, but use of scientific methodology and statistical analysis has led us to scientific way of practicing medicine. In 1990, medicine resident Dr. Jordan Boat introduced a new concept called scientific medicine, which was later on changed to evidence-based medicine. And these are the various uh, pillars of evidence-based medicine, starting from case control studies to randomized control trials. So all these lead us to the concept of evidence-based medicine. And despite extensive research over many years, the causal events leading to OAG are still not very well understood. And besides intraocular pressure, other causes are also being looked into and researched into. And these are the various trials, OHTS, EMGT, CNTGS, Advanced Glaucoma Intervention Study, and CISTES all have stressed on the role of ocular perfusion pressure in glaucoma. But are these questions abstract? A recent meta-analysis of all the medical literature suggested that sufficient evidence exists to warrant a randomized clinical trial to answer them. So do we have adequate evidence to justify routine assessment of ocular pressure, perfusion pressure in all our glaucoma patients? This I already stressed on. The World Glaucoma Association 6 consensus publication have said that there is a definite role of ocular perfusion pressure in uh, not only development of glaucoma, but also progression of glaucoma after the target intraocular pressure is achieved. Baltimore Eye Survey, Egna Newmark Study, Proyoctover, Los Angeles Latino Eye Study, Barbados Eye Study, all have told us that diastolic perfusion pressure is more important. Los Angeles Latino Eye Study said that if uh, the diastolic perfusion pressure is less than 40, the glaucoma risk increases almost 1.9 fold. And Baltimore Eye Survey said if the diastolic perfusion pressure is still lower, that is less than 30, the glaucoma risk increases by six fold. So there are evidence that OPP contributes to glaucoma is favored not only by cross-sectional but also by longitudinal studies. So we all know what are cross-sectional and longitudinal studies. Incident studies are the most valuable to determine risk factors because they are longitudinal in their design and they provide direct measure of the true risk of developing new disease over a time period. So EMGT was the first randomized clinical trial to document effectiveness of treatment in reducing progression in patients with OAG. And the EMGT suggested a potential role for vascular factor on progression given the positive association with low systolic perfusion pressure, low systolic blood pressure, and CVS disease history. Baltimore Eye Survey was a population-based cross-sectional prevalence survey and they found that less than 30 millimeter mercury of diastolic perfusion pressure increases the glaucoma risk by six-fold. Egna Newmark study was done to basically to study the impact of vascular risk factors on the prevalence of POAG. It was a population-based cross-section study, and they found that there was a correlation between IOP and BP, which was statistically significant for both systolic and diastolic pressure. The Egna Newmark study found correlation between systolic blood pressure and higher uh, BP that is unrelated to age. And they found that uh, the low diastolic perfusion pressure is a very important risk factor for POAG. Proyoctover study uh, was another survey of ocular disease prevalence and specific to nearly 5,000 Latino individuals, and they found that there was a fourfold increase in OAG among subjects with a diastolic perfusion pressure less than 50 millimeter of mercury compared with those who had a higher diastolic perfusion pressure. Los Angeles Latino Eye Study was again a population based cross sectional study done on more than 6,000 patients. And what they found was that low perfusion pressure, high systolic blood pressure, and mean blood pressure all are associated with higher prevalence of open angle glaucoma. There was a Thessaloniki eye study which was done to find association of open angle glaucoma with perfusion pressure status and what they again found 
that the, there was an association of borderline significance between low diastolic perfusion pressure and POAG. And low diastolic perfusion pressure may be associated with increased risk of POAG, and there was no association between DOPP and pseudo exfoliation glau glaucoma. Barbados eye study was a longitudinal study, and it was why it was done in uh, patients of uh, frequent descent. Uh, reason was a frequent descent population has earlier onset of glaucoma, they have faster progression of glaucoma and they also develop more severe visual field loss. And what they concluded was that uh, lower ocular perfusion pressure were associated with increased open angle glaucoma and all and the relative risk for lower systolic perfusion pressure, diastolic perfusion pressure and mean perfusion pressure were all statistically significant. Blue Mountain Eye study was done in cohort study. Uh, it was a cohort study done in urban Australian population. And what they found was that eyes with narrower retinal arteriolar and velular caliber at baseline were more likely to develop OAG. So hypothesis was that due to decreased oxygen demand after uh, loss of retinal ganglion cell. The, then Canadian glaucoma study was uh, done. And what they found was that there was four independent predictive factors for glaucomatous field progression. Uh, these were higher baseline age, higher mean baseline intraocular pressure, and female sex. And they, uh, then this was another study done in Japan, Tajini study, and what they found was that uh, the most of POAG patient, almost 92% of the POAG patients diagnosed had IOP within the normal range. IOP was still identified as a significant risk factor for POG, and they also found association of lower perfusion pressure. Leuven eye study was done in 2016, and they again found that the POG patients presented with higher systolic and diastolic blood pressure when compared to healthier individuals. Leuven eye study concluded that uh, it created a vast database to help find which vascular related parameter can be used to determine the extent of the disease and which may accurately be integrated in risk stratification models. So, and then this another study done in China, uh, which was name, uh, named as Beijing Eye Study, Handan Eye Study, and they also found that there was a trend of increased risk of glaucoma with lower minimal diastolic perfusion pressure, lower minimal systolic perfusion pressure, and lower minimal average mean ocular perfusion pressure. Uh, Indian study was done, this is Chennai glaucoma study, and it was what they concluded was uh, prevalence of glaucoma was more in urban population, there was more association with increasing age and high baseline IOP, and there was but they did not find any association with myopia and hypertension. Arvind eye study was done, and they found that there was, although there was no difference in OAG between hypertensives and non-hypertensives, but there was more OAG in patients on antihypertensive therapy. Rotterdam study uh, was a prospective population-based study, and what they found was that there is definite association between low diastolic perfusion pressure and prevalence of OAG. So association between low diastolic perfusion pressure and prevalence of OAG has been found in studies like Baltimore, Agna Newmark, Proyectover, Barbados Eye Study, and relationship between systolic perfusion pressure and prevalence of OAG is less consistent. Uh, only uh, Blue Mountain Eye Study and Barbados Eye Study found association between systolic perfusion pressure and prevalence of OAG. So significant association between BP and OAG uh, has been demonstrated by Egna Newmark, Rotterdam, and Blue Mountain Eye Study, whereas Barbados Eye Study, EMGT, and Proyectover found no association between BP and OAG. So uh, there is conclusion which can be derived from population-based epidemiological studies. While a positive association exists between BP and intraocular pressure, similar link between hypertension and OAG is not very well established. Low ocular perfusion pressure 
particularly low diastolic perfusion pressure is significantly related to OAG. OAG is a multifactorial disease that develops from interaction of genetic and non-genetic factors and perfusion pressure and vascular factors are likely involved in this interaction. An underlying factor of impaired vascular autoregulation may lead to poor perfusion in OAG. Virtual laboratories have been established by Dr. Harris. It is called, known as Ellen Harris Mathematical Model, where also they have demonstrated mathematically how perfusion pressure is important. Experimental studies had been done. Now we have OCTA, where they have demonstrated a reduced disc flow index and vessel density in glaucoma. And this has been demonstrated in various studies, which are, I'm not going to enumerate. So many key research questions still remain. At night, IOP increases, whereas blood pressure falls. Could nighttime perfusion pressure be a predictor for glaucoma risk, as was explained by Dr. Kiran? Might systemic antihypertensive treatment affect the risk of developing the disease and progression? If so, could the dosing of these medications be adjusted to reduce the risk of progression? Only time will tell whether the results of these landmark studies and trials are leading us to a correct path or it is a case of barking up a wrong tree. Now, I'll, uh, with that, I finish this talk on trials and studies, and uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, N. Z. Farooqi to talk on various instrumentation that have been uh, devised to calculate ocular perfusion pressure. Thank you very much, sir, for this informative talk. Uh, so there are a lot of things which we can do right now. Ocular blood flow definitely is a concept, and how to measure the ocular blood flow in our clinical scenarios, and how we can basically use the information which we get to treat our patients. So that is very important. So sir would be talking about the various instruments through which we can basically evaluate the ocular blood flow. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Balan, Dr. and thank you, Dr. Vineet. Uh, so I'll be speaking on the instruments to evaluate the ocular blood flow. The vascular abnormalities and this regression may contribute to development of glaucoma. The measurement of ocular blood flow is complicated by the fact that the posterior pole of the eye is nourished by two different vascular blades, the retina and the choroid, differing in terms of physiological and pathological properties. Now, in spite of accessibility of the retinal vasculature, the quantitative data on retinal hemodynamics is still lacking. Now, there are various non-invasive techniques for measurement of the ocular blood flow, such as color Doppler imaging, the laser spectral technique, the laser Doppler flowmetry, the retinal vessel analyzer, the retinal oximetry, the blue field and top tech technique, and the invasive techniques are the laser ophthalmic angiography with fluorescein and or ICG. The two recently developed techniques are the Doppler Fourier domain OST and the optical coherence tomography angiography. Now many technologies are based on Doppler effect for measurement of ocular blood flow. The Doppler effect is the change in frequency of sound or light of the received frequency from that of the sent frequency if there is motion. Now, one of the very important aspects of the ocular blood flow analysis is the blood flow volume in the vessels, which is a product of velocity as well as cross-sectional area of the vessel. The color Doppler imaging is basically an ultrasound technique. The velocity is obtained from the Doppler frequency shift of the moving RBCs. Greater the Doppler frequency shift, greater is the velocity. And a colored representation of the blood flow using Doppler shifted frequency is portrayed. Now the Doppler frequency shift is less when the ultrasound beam is not parallel to the direction of the travel of the blood vessels. So considering the normal arterial anatomy of the orbit, the ophthalmic artery provides the nasal straightest portion of this vessel. Unfortunately, it reduces the relevance of the result because the blood to the eye has already left the ophthalmic artery via the posterior ciliary artery and the central retinal artery. Now the velocity waveform of the artery is portrayed uh, or imaged as a high peak systolic velocity, PSV spike, followed by a rapid drop of velocity to a low end diastolic velocity, that's EDV, and there's a dichrotic notch, uh, notch usually present. The velocity waveform from the vein is depicted as a, is generally non pulsatile in the superior ophthalmic vein. However, it may be pulsatile, uh, slightly pulsatile in central retinal vein, and it is synchronized with the IOP. So hence, in central retinal vein, we calculate the, the velocity maximum and velocity minimum now, this is the color Doppler imaging of the central retinal artery and central retinal vein. Below the red line, below the green line, we see the velocity wave line. Above the green line, it represents the arterial blood velocity. And the velocity wave under the green line represents the venous blood velocity. 
Now, these are the various blood velocity waveforms produced by spectral analysis of Doppler signals from the eye and the orbit of the ophthalmic artery, central uh, retinal artery, central retinal vein, posterior ciliary artery, the superior ophthalmic vein, and the vortex. We can see that there's a spike in the arteries, whereas uh, it's usually non pulsatile in cases of vein. Now, resistive index is one of the very valuable um, uh, aspect for ocular blood flow analysis. It's a measure of the vascular resistance. It is not clear if it represents the retinal vascular resistance accurately. In fact, it is considered more appropriate for the low resistance retrobulbar vessels. Regarding the reproducibility, reliability, and resolution in the color Doppler imaging, the lower velocities found in smaller ocular vessels are close to instrumental detection resolution. The flow rates lower than one to three centimeters per second may be missed, giving false impression that the vessel is occluded. The undetectable Doppler frequency shift in small vessels do not necessarily means absent flow, but only indicates the limit of the resolution of the machine. Thus, smaller blood vessels are often less reliably examined. The higher velocity values provide better reproducibility than the lower values. Now, the mean blood velocities are prone to error. So the end diastolic velocity of the short posterior artery has the highest coefficient of variation. However, the peak velocities are less susceptible to such errors. The peak systolic velocity of central retinal artery has the lowest coefficient of variation. Now, what are the vascular changes in the glaucoma? In the glaucoma patient, there's a reduction in the peak systolic velocity in the ophthalmic artery, and there's an increased resistive index in the central retinal artery and the posterior ciliary artery. And in normal tension glaucoma, because of vascular ocular uh, vasospasm, there's increased resistivity index in the ophthalmic artery. Now, post trabeculectomy, it is seen there's a reduction in the resistivity, in, uh, resistivity index, and there's an increase in the blood velocity occurs in both central retinal artery and the posterior ciliary arteries. However, there's certain limitation in the color Doppler imaging. No quantitative emotion on the vessel diameter is available, hence the calculation of total blood flow is not possible. The Doppler frequency shift is less when the ultrasound beam is not parallel to the direction of the travel of the blood vessels. The reproducibility requires experience and skill, it is expensive, and the ocular pressure can increase the IOP. Now, there's another instrument, laser Doppler velocity metry. It is non-invasive technique based on the Poiseuille principle and the Doppler effect. It measures the blood velocity, the vessel diameter, hence, and the cross-sectional area. In retinal vessels, it measures the flow only in one direction. Hence, the retinal blood flow in one single vessel can be calculated. It cannot be used to measure uh, circulation in the optic nerve head because it requires to measure blood flow in multiple directions. So there's another instrument, laser Doppler flow metry. It quantitatively measures uh, blood flow in the retinal, optic nerve head, and choroidal capillaries in arbitrary units. In this technique, the laser light is not directed towards the retinal vessels, but on the vascularized tissue with no larger vessels visible. There is considerable variation in scattering properties between the subjects due to variation in the vascular density and the vessel orientation within the relatively small volume of tissue sampled. Hence, inter-individual comparison of the laser Doppler flowmetry data is not recommended. Although the, there is a high intra-individual reproducibility, however, the precise depth of measurement is controversial. And most of the studies, they conclude that the LDF sample, the optic nerve tissue supplied by both the superficial retina derived circulation as well as the deeper choroid derived circulation. So we have another scanning laser Doppler flow metry. Now, this is a scanning confocal version of the LDF. It combines the principle of scanning laser tomography and the laser Doppler flow metry. The measurement is in retina are hampered by the fact that the contribution from the underlying choriocapillaries still cannot be excluded. Now we have laser speckle flowgraphy. It's a non-contact, non-invasive technique. It is based on the laser speckle vec, which is basically a phenomena of interference in the event. It is observed when coherent lines are scattered by diffusing surface. The rate of varying pattern is utilized to determine the retinal blood cells velocity, quantified to determine the retinal blood flow velocity. How are the limitations? The, it measures only relative blood flow, and it does not assess the vessel diameter, hence the total volume is not assess, assessed. The values obtained cannot be compared directly since the structure of the tissue and its composition are different in different eyes. And also, it cannot be compared in the same eye at different times since the scattering property of the tissue may not be same in the settings of the pathology. A recent advancement, however, has provided written, uh, the relative flow volume and the vascular diameter. Now, we have another instrument, retinal vessel analyzer. Now, it also determines the retinal vessel diameter, which is a very important determinant for the retinal blood flow. The basic principle is the erythroids, uh, that erythrocytes within the retinal vessels absorb light at maximum wavelength of 400 to 600 nanometers, whereas the surrounding tissue mostly reflects it. 
So the difference between the brightness profile of the retrohead column within the vessels compared with the surrounding tissue are then used for further analysis. There's another instrument called retinal functional imager. Again, here is non-invasive blood flow velocity of medium-sized vessels. The principle is that the device identifies motion of the RBCs in retinal vessels, comparing several images of retina taken under green light within a very short time interval. The advantage is that it also provides capillary perfusion map within the foveal avascular zone and options to measure vessel oxygenation and metabolic mapping. The limitation, however, is that it provides only flow velocity and not the flow volume. Now we have a blue field entoptic technique. It's a non-invasive technique based on the blue field entoptic phenomena. This phenomena is manifested due to difference in absorption properties of the RBCs and the leukocytes. When the retina is illuminated with the blue light, the moving RBCs absorb the light, but the leukocytes do not absorb the light. The leukocytes is absorbed as flying corpuscles. The speed and density of the leukocyte observed are compared to the speed and density of the computer simulated leukocytes as viewed by the individuals. Hence the limitation is that it is inherently subjective and it's uncertain whether leukocyte flux corresponds to retinal flow under all circumstances. Now, regarding the blood flow analysis, the blood flow we know is a product of cross sectional area and the mean retinal blood velocity. The techniques that measure blood velocity only has limitation as there is no information about the blood flow per se. The interpretation of the results is hampered by the fact it is difficult to de decide whether an increase in the blood velocity is caused by an increase in blood flow or by vasoconstriction within the measured vascular blood. Uh, vascular bed. Consequently, to determine retinal blood flow and for understanding its regulation, the exact determination of vessel diameter is crucial to know the exact blood volume that is being transmitted. Now, we have spectral domain Doppler OCD. It quantitatively measures blood flow along structural imaging of retina. Now, this technique combines the principle of laser Doppler shift for velocity measurement and spectral domain OCD for simultaneous measurement of the vessel diameter. Thus, volumetric flow calculation is provided. Now, it is appropriate for large vessels around disk, not sensitive enough for measure to measure accurately the low velocities of small vessel disk microcirculation. For blood flow measurements, only peripapillary veins are considered since arteries cause multiple phase wrapping issues due to the faster velocities. Now, optical coherence tomography, angiography is one of the latest uh, uh, technique that is being used for blood flow analysis. The, uh, OCTA is a non contact imaging technique that allows for visualization of the retina and choroid vasculature without the need to inject a dye. The OCTA detects the motion of RBCs as intrinsic contrast. The cross section OCTA angiogram can superimpose color coded flow information on grayscale structural information and fast images. Thus, both blood flow and the retinal structures information may be presented together. The images can visualize vascular position at various depths of retinal layers. The OCA device detects vessels on basis of amplitude decorrelation resulting from blood flow. The decorrelation algorithm is basically identifies the profuse written vessels from surrounding static tissues based on amplitude variation differences in the non-static tissues compared to the static tissues. The vessels with very low or slow or absent flow will not be detected, hence, and it is and it does not differentiate the vessel with faster flow from the slow flow. For this reason, the term vessel density is used as quantitative measure reflecting the proportion of area occupied by the flowing vessels. The dense parapapillary macrovasculature is normally attenuated in both superficial disc vasculature as well as the deep lamina cruciform in glaucomatous eyes. The flow index is calculated by averaging the decorrelation signals in the OCT angiograms and it has been shown to have both high sensitivity and specificity in differentiating glaucomatous eyes from that of the normal eyes. Now these are the ops, mm, OCTA images of uh, optic disproportion in glaucoma compared to the normal, showing decrease in the disproportion in the whole width OCD angiograms and the cross-sectional angiograms. Now these are the OCTA image of uh, optic disc at various depth in the glaucoma compared to normal eye, showing decreased vessel density in the whole depth angiogram, the retinal angiogram, the choroidal angiogram, and the scleral or lamina cribosa angiograms. Now these are the images of OCTA RNA will density maps uh, which helps to differentiate between the glaucoma, the glaucoma suspect, and the normal eyes. The OSTA vessel density map of RNFL uh, here uh, it shows uh, corresponding visual field defects also in severe, moderate, and the mild glaucoma compared to the healthy individuals. Now the advantage of OSTA is that the vas it visualizes the vasculature in greater details in the 3D image and its ability to calculate vessel density and flow index. Full optic disc vascular tissue 
layered network of the radial peripapillary optic nerve and prelaminal and laminic robusta, and it's non-invasive. However, the disadvantages are that it, the artifacts of the superficial veins vessels when imaging at a deeper level, particularly in the optic disc due to presence of larger central retinal vessels. The flow index may include retinal microvasculature when measuring the disc vasculature. It cannot distinguish between the tissue loss and ischemia. No long-term studies of glaucoma progression and unknown prognostic uh, ability has been done. It does not assess the vascular leakage. Now the current ocular blood flow imaging modalities uh, issue, we can say that there's no single imaging modality which can uh, quantify all relevant vascular beds in glaucoma. The current devices do not measure structure and blood flow simultaneously. The OST-based uh, blood flow imaging is emerging as the next step in the dual purpose assessment. Now regarding conclusion, the disturbed ocular blood flow or vascular dislocation are the new emerging risk factors. The clinician can investigate and evaluate the microcirculation using multiple instruments available. The continually evolving technologies may help to target these risk factors, becoming integral investigative modalities in the future clinical practice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Faruqi, for a very elaborate talk. And now we invite Dr. Vineet Segal, who would be talking about the ocular blood flow analysis in clinical scenarios with some interesting cases. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Bhalla, sir, for providing me this opportunity. So the topic that is assigned to me assigned to me is evidence in favor of role of ocular perfusion pressure. So as sir has told, we have color Doppler imaging, we have OCT angiography right now in our, our armamentarium, which we are doing it in our clinical scenarios. Various institutes are also having access to OCT angiography and uh, our radiologists, they are doing regularly carotid Doppler. So with the small amount of training now, they are also doing the uh, ocular Doppler. So I would be talking about these two as my evidence for the ocular blood flow analysis. Uh, we have highlighted uh, in our previous sessions that yes, the vascular theory basically makes sense. So if I basically tell you here that yes, internal carotid artery is the main artery which supplies the eye. It gives rise to ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic artery has then two branches. Uh, one is your central retinal artery and the other relevant artery is the short posterior ciliary artery as you can see here. So this short posterior ciliary artery, central retinal artery and the ophthalmic artery, these are the three arteries where we should basically have our focus to know what is going on in the optic nerve head. So now in my practice, in my clinical practice, in which patients should I go for a ocular blood flow analysis? First of all, as we have mentioned here, the patients who are having glaucoma, the subset of the patients who are having a normal tension glaucoma or those patients where even after control of intraocular pressure, now we have the intraocular pressure in the target IOP, if still they are progressing, that is an indication for doing a ocular blood flow analysis. The second sub subset of patients who are having ocular ischemic syndrome because we all know that the internal carotid artery would be basically affected there. Then the patients who are having vessel occlusion like central retinal venous occlusion, central retinal artery occlusion, that our retina colleagues are seeing day in and day out, definitely it can have a role also there. And this is my favorite indication, sir, detecting underlying undiagnosed systemic comorbidities in the patient with the ocular history. So the patient comes and he says, he, after getting a femto laser cataract surgery with e of lens, now he says that, sir, I am not heavy, sometimes I get some visual blurring and we basically diagnose him. He, uh, it can be some mevomitis or something like that or there can be amaurosis and he is referred to the glaucoma clinic with a 21-22 IOP. And we did an ocular Doppler and we saw that there is something else which is going on. This is not a functional complaints. So my protocol in my OPD, patients as I told you who are glaucoma, NTG patients, then what I do is I basically go for a 24 hour BP monitoring in these patients. So if there is a diastolic dip there in the night or there is a variation in blood pressure, definitely as ma'am and sir have told this, this would definitely affect the ocular perfusion pressure. So basically now it comes that the theory is coming into clinical practice. How we can basically assimilate all what sir have told us in our clinical practice, we have to basically tell the patient to get a ambulatory BP monitoring. And then we basically do a ocular blood flow analysis. We send the patient to a radiologist and then to the cardiologist. So we should have a triangle here. The triangle consists of one ophthalmologist, the second radiologist who is doing the ocular Doppler and third the cardiologist. 
because we have told here that yes, vascular component takes a very important role. So, um, as sir has told us about color Doppler imaging, I won't go into too much of uh, practical details. Again, the same thing, ophthalmic artery, central retinal artery, short posterior surgery artery. Sir have told us that yes, there are few parameters we have to basically uh, see. So uh, that is my better half, Dr. Anshal, who is doing a Doppler, uh, ocular Doppler in a patient. Um, and not going into too much of the techniques, as you can see. Now earlier, what was told was that actually this is all in the uh, concept. We practically uh, are not doing too much of ocular Doppler. And if we are doing ocular Doppler, we are not getting good waveforms. So I can just show you that, yes, there is evidence, sir. You can see here that we are getting very good flows. So yes, it's everyone, those who have access institutes or those who have friends in the radiology department, yes, you can get good flows of the central retinal artery as well as of the ophthalmic artery, as you can see here. So these are repeatable structures like a visual fields we do and in visual fields there there is something which is called a reproducibility similar reproducibility we can get in our ocular doppler studies as well so i would not say my experience i would say my learning so i am doing it for uh, almost all subsets of population there are three studies with three theses which are also going on uh, in subdarjan hospital and whenever we do uh, give a obf report it's a very important thing is we just do not have to see the parameters, also see the experience of the radiologist, what he or she thinks when she is doing it. So we write here impression. Now what, what is the basic aim of writing the impression? I will just show you here. Okay, so there are, as sir has told us, there are different type of waveforms of ophthalmic artery, central retinal artery, and short posterior ciliary artery. Now, why they make a sense that I would be talking about in my first case. So this was a 74-year-old gentleman, pseudo fake in both eyes with baseline IOP of 21 millimeter. After getting a cataract surgery, uh, he says that, sir, I am not very happy with the cataract surgery. My quality of vision goes down sometimes, then it is okay. He was just a hypertensive, a controlled hypertensive, nothing else. Uh, there was a small pale disc, almost normal type of disc. Uh, we did all types of tests, visual field, OCT, DV, everything seems to be okay. Uh, I think this was way back in 2017, 2018, sir, when, when I uh, started this uh, ocular blood flow analysis in few of my patients. I sent the patient to the radiologist and I just call, got a call uh, in my OPD that something which is not very regular that is coming. As you can see, these are the normal waveforms. These are the normal waveforms and see this red area. You are getting some abnormal waveforms. Now what to do? We are getting some abnormal waveforms here. So my radiologist told me that, okay, I am doing an ocular Doppler. Let's go for a carotid Doppler as well. And now you see, in the carotid Doppler, you are getting a 100% blockage of the internal carotid artery. So what might be happening here is some collaterals which are now forming around the optic nerve head, which are basically causing these aberrant waveforms. So the patient came with the ocular history and we got something which is more important in terms of his vascularity here and the patient was referred to the uh, cardiac uh, department. Uh, this was a case too where a 75 year old young gentleman came to the OPD with a similar kind of complaints after getting a cataract surgery. Uh, there was a baseline IOP of 24 millimeter of mercury, ocular hypertensive, everything was almost okay. Uh, OBF analysis and carotid Doppler was done. And then the patient was sent for cardiological evaluation. So what are the findings in the color Doppler? In the color Doppler, the SPCAs, the short posterior ciliary arteries. Now I tell you that normally what happens is the ophthalmic artery and the uh, central retinal artery, these waveforms are basically seen easily, but sometimes the short posterior ciliary artery waveforms are not seen even with the effort. So two or three times the, uh, it was tried to get some SPCA waveforms, but not in the nasal or not in the temporal side, we are not getting any of the SPCAs. 
Uh, the carotid uh, Doppler was done and there was a blockage. The patient was sent for the uh, cardiological department. I always complete a triad here. So the patient was sent here and then uh, it was seen that there is a, a stent, uh, stenting was done in the patient and the patient again was uh, basically sent to the uh, the radiological radiology department for the reocular Doppler and when we did the Doppler again we saw that there is some blood flow we are getting in the short posterior ciliary artery. So the hypothesis is that after basically we improved the flow in the internal carotid artery now some flow can be directed in the SPCA. Now this is the first time not uh, in the literature we have basically seen this but the problem is that the patient is all still having the same symptoms. Patient still says that I am having the amaurosis pyogex, I am getting um, blurring in vision sometimes. There is no change in the clinical symptoms. So definitely these all whatever we talked about the OCT angiography, the ocular Doppler, these are some expensive techniques and you need a reproducibility trained radiologist and uh, definitely a costly machines, the ocular Doppler and the OCT angiography, they are costly and we do not have long term data and the normative data right now. Sir, can I have one minute please? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I basically end my slides uh, with this one that whatever we do, we do OCT angiography, we do ocular Doppler, there we should go ahead with the validation and calibration of our technique, how to do it. Like visual fields, we do, we do basically train our interns, our optometrists, how to do it. To assess in which of the patients the op ocular blood flow can be compromised or decreased, then to assess the usefulness of any intervention, whether we give any drug or we go for any cardiological intervention, can it increase our ocular blood flow? And the last but not the least is that if this ocular blood flow is even increased, can it lead to any decrease in the progression of glaucoma? That is the question still needs to be answered. Thank you very much again, sir, for giving me this opportunity to present these cases in front of you. Thank you, Dr. Vineet, for a very interesting and a very clinical-oriented talk. I now invite Dr. Jitender Singh Bhalla to give his talk on triple drug fixed dose combination in glaucoma management and Indian innovation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kiran. Dr. Vini, that was a very wonderful illustration of uh, the practical uh, concept, how you have evaluated and how you demonstrated that uh, stenting of uh, internal carotid artery could improve and reverse the blood flow in the short posterior ciliary artery. Uh, I think that's a great uh, lesson learned from your practical cases. Uh, the topic I'm going to cover is triple drug fixed dose combination in glaucoma management. We all know about the fixed uh, drug combination, how they are helping us in decreasing the number of drops that uh, uh, need to be put to control, achieve the target intraocular pressure. Uh, th this is as far as statistics is concerned, uh, glaucoma is the leading cause of irreversible blindness and second only to cataracts uh, as far as blindness is concerned. And what is the Indian scenario? 12 million people affected and nearly 1.2 million people are blind due to glaucoma. But unfortunate part is more than 90% of these cases remain undiagnosed. In open angle glaucoma, medical therapy is the most frequently used intervention for lowering intraocular pressure and is typically the first line therapy in most of the patients. And combination of agents are often required to achieve and maintain target intraocular pressure level. And intensive combination treatment leads to considerably greater IOP reduction and prevent the disease pro uh, uh, progression. And so as far as the calendar of various anti-glaucoma drugs is concerned, the first drug which came into vogue was pilocarpine parasympathomimetic way back in 1875. And it was almost 100 years later that we had in 1978 beta blocker in the form of timolol. Then we had uh, prostaglandin analogs, alpha agonists, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and then 
slowly we also saw advent of various drugs and initially most of these drugs of various uh, uh, the uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, class of drugs whether it, it, it was parasympathomimetic or whether it was alpha agonist whether, whether prostaglandin most of these combination were beta blockers then we had non beta blocker combination of the drugs also in the form of alpha agonist brimonidine with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like uh, brenzolamide so the iop control is very important to reduce the risk of uh, glaucoma progression because uncontrolled iop is a key risk factor for the development and progression of glaucomatous optic neuropathy and each 1 mm mercury decrease in iop reduces the risk of progression by close to 10 to 20% and various landmark studies have given guidelines and recommendations for the goals of glaucoma therapy like emgt suggested that uh, there is uh, by 1 mm mercury decrease there is 10 to 13% decrease in the risk per millimeter of mercury OHTS told us 10 percent per millimeter mercury EH, European glaucoma prevention study told us 12 percent uh, the Canadian glaucoma st study and UK uh, glaucoma treatment study said that there is a 19 percent decrease per millimeter of mercury uh, decrease in intraocular pressure so there is a guideline recommendations by Asia Pacific glaucoma guidelines CK guidelines and uh, ICO guidelines which uh, nice guidelines which also recommend the use of combination therapy in the management of glaucoma so what are the issues with multiple me medication why do we need to have fixed drug combination because multiple medication have issues like compliance issue and there is increased preservative exposure and there is also washout effect of the second drug uh, of the first drug after you have installed the second drug so it improves there is improvement of adherence with fixed drug combination because fist, uh, if you compare the fixed drug combination with individual components, you will find that there are less number of eye drops instilled, washout effect is almost nil, the tolerability is more, convenience of administration, compliance is more, and there is definite decrease in exposure to the preservatives. Preservative exposure with multiple de drug therapy is a cause of concern because it has been found that almost 40% of the patients of open angle glaucoma they suffer from ocular surface disease and long-term use of topical drugs especially in those patients receiving multiple drug regime have demonstrated various side effects like hyperemia itching tear film instability stinging burning and dryness and the incidence of toxicity can be mitigated by decreased preservative exposure so fixed drug combination therapies decrease ocular exposure to preservatives and have the potential to improve the patient compliance so maximum medical therapy concept is the use of three or more different classes of anti glaucoma agents to achieve maximum lowering of intraocular pressure and because it attempts to achieve the best possible therapeutic outcome with medications and decreases the adverse effects and compliance issues so availability of three or more different class of drugs was achievable in almost two bottles but now availability of three or more class of drugs as a single fixed drug combination is achievable with a simplified installation regime so how many tropical drops are too many this question is uh, uh, a very practical question if we have uh, 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 one drug which is uh, having prostaglandin analog and bottle 2 is having either beta blocker or rock inhibitor and then we have number of drops may be uh, 2 and number of medicines will be 3 and similarly if we have different combination one prostaglandin and other combination of uh, with beta blockers or combination of alpha agonist with beta blocker the number of medications and number of drops you will find that keep on increasing so counting uh, instead of uh, uh, what I propose is that rather than counting the medication or number of bottles a patient is using, we should be counting the number of daily eye drop installation that patient has to make. And using that perspective, today's fixed drug co combination can uh, allow us to prescribe more medications without simultaneously increasing the number of drops. So these are the list of currently available fixed drug combination it can be carbonic anhydrase inhibitor with beta blockers 
prostaglandin analog with beta blocker fixed dose combination and non prostaglandin analog fixed dose combination well, like brimonidine and brinzolamide. So there have been published studies of triple fixed drug combination which just uh, decreases not only the number of drops, although we are using three class of drugs, but the number of drops have really decreased. And these are the various studies which have been published on the role of triple fixed drug combination uh, right from 2009 where they combined timolol, brimonidine, and dorzolamide. Then in 2012, again, we had same combination. So these uh, triple does fixed drug combination have tried and tested and published in the literature. And recently, a triple drug combination has been developed in our own country for treatment of glaucoma. And trial and toxicology studies have also been conducted for this purpose. And what is the rationale? Rationale is, like I mentioned earlier, that uh, the number of drops have decreased, improved compliance, cost benefit to the patient, and there is ease of adding an additional class of anti-glaucoma drugs. So this triple drug, fixed drug combination of timolol, brinzolamide, and brimonidine, at, besides the various practical uh, uh, efficacies, we also have the improved, uh, it is acting at various different mechanisms, like, uh, uh, it, the, the, there is increased uveoscleral outflow with brimonidine, decreased aqueous humor production with timolol, improved ocular blood flow and neuro, improved ocular blood flow with brinzolamide, and there is pro possible neuroprotective role on optic nerve in glaucoma with uh, brimonidine. So there are various mechanisms by which this triple fixed drug combination has been, uh, is supposed to act. So this study was conducted with the primary objective to assess the efficacy of this triple uh, drug combination and uh, uh, the secondary objective was to study the safety and tolerability of triple combination of this timolol, brimonidine and brinzolamide. And this, uh, the various uh, parameters which were assessed were on the uh, first visit on day three uh, after baseline and then after at week two, week six and week 12. And we, what we found was that IOP reduction from the baseline to week 12 was close to 10.5 plus minus uh, 0.18 millimeter of mercury and that was statistically significant. And change in IOP from baseline to end of study, that is week 12, were again statistically uh, significant in all the cases. And if we compared the proportion of subjects achieving IOP less than 18 millimeter mercury at weeks 2, 6, and 12, we found that more than 50% of the study subjects attained IOP less than 18 millimeter mercury as early as six weeks, and the proportion of subjects who attained IOP less than 18 millimeter mercury at study end was as high as almost 87%. So general well-being of the subjects when it was assessed that more than 95% of the study subject rated as good because there was decreased uh, side effects like dryness, itching, and irritation. Adverse events which was noted was all uh, just 7.5% and the proportion of ocular adverse effect and non-ocular uh, adverse effects were noted. Ocular adverse effects were dryness, burning sensation, eye uh, redness, and itching and all these symptoms were mild to moderate. So because of reduced preservatives, there is definite advantage with triple fixed drug uh, combination. So there are current unmet needs. If the disease progresses despite treatment, IOP fluctuation increase the risk of visual field progression, inaccurate IOP monitoring and patient non-adherence, all these things can be uh, uh, countered if we give the patient particularly these elder, elderly patients, just one bottle where they can have three classes of drugs. Thank you, everyone, for your kind and patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Bhalla. It was very informative talk on the concept and advantages of triple drug fixed dose combination in glaucoma. Thank you. If there are any questions, I think you can give uh, to our panelists. We'll be too glad to answer. Dr. Kiran, uh, uh, what do you think of the various uh, drugs, particularly in a patient like normotensive glaucoma or in a patient of open angle glaucoma, who has uh, achieved the target intraocular pressure and is also having uh, systemic hypertension? 
what will the class of anti-glaucoma drugs would you uh, prescribe and would you recommend any change, would you recommend to his physician any change in his antihypertensive treatment? See, basically, PG analogs would be a first uh, cause of treatment. First of all, uh, because they have a better IOP lowering effect, they lower it by 30% as compared to the B and beta blockers should preferably be avoided, especially if they are an antihypertensive, because uh, systemic and topical beta blockers lower OPP, lower the blood pressure, and Latano PG analogs have been known to increase OPP. And they're also called nighttime blunting of the dynal curve. So the nighttime IOP would be better controlled and hence the ocular perfusion pressures. Dr. Faruqi, what would be the, uh, the, if the patient is already on prostaglandin analog, what would be your second uh, add-on drug? Will it be uh, alpha agonist or carbonic anhydrous inhibitor to achieve the target and Doppler pressure in such patients? Because particularly, it is said that carbonic anhydrous inhibitor increases the ocular pressure. Yeah, I prefer to use uh, carbo and, uh, carbonic anhydrous inhibitors because it, it does have, um, there are studies to show that it increases the ocular blood, pro, um, blood pro perfusion pressure, basically. That will be my drug of choice. As an uh, Dr. Vineet, do you Sir, think uh, all glaucoma patients should have uh, comprehensive, we should assess their blood pressure monitoring? Uh, you very nicely told that most of your glaucoma patients also undergo 24-hour BP monitoring. Yes, sir. Do you uh, recommend as a matter of routine? No, sir. I, I would. So, uh, seven years down the lane with ocular blood flow analysis going on and I am... Uh, uh, fortunate enough because my better half, she's in a government institute and she can do it free of cost. So we have to see what is the cost that is incurred to the patient also. And uh, we have not got any specific results which are showing that one drug, drug, drug A is better than drug B or drug C, even after lowering of the intraocular pressure. So we are doing a study uh, where the patient is when diagnosed, uh, a primary open angle glaucoma patient, when he is diagnosed, before starting the medication, he, is, he got, gets his uh, ocular blood flow analysis done and then after the uh, drug is started we do it again and we have not seen any major difference any statistical significant difference so I would not recommend it into in all the patients only in those patients where there is a progression even after control of target intraocular pressure and second is normal tension glaucoma patients there because the cost in our country is a very very major factor sir. I Even after the availability of OCTA, do you still go in for the Doppler imaging? Yes, sir. It uh, has a lot of uh, uh, limitations so uh, as now, the body uh, is stressed out. Because we have access to both, sir, so that's why uh, okay, we can not a question of access, it's a huh. question of would so you So OCT angiography per se would tell you about the only superficial things. It would, when we talk about the concept of OCT uh, angiography, it is the, it basically the, uh, the capillaries which are the macular capillaries and the optic nerve head capillaries. It won't tell you what is going on retrobulbar. When you are doing a carotid Doppler, you can get a retrobulbar. Second thing is in OCT angiography, you would not be get, getting the actual access to the art capillaries which are at the optic nerve head because of the shadowing effect. Signal strength is a very major factor when you are interpreting a OCT angiography. We have seen that in six months OCT angiography, in the same patient, they are getting decrease maybe because of increase in the cataract. So that is very much limiting factors in the OCT angiography. OCT angiography basically was a technique which was earlier used for the retina people. Now the, it is, there are studies which they sh are showing that it may have a, uh, some role in the glaucoma. Only two things that have been shown. One thing is a microvascular dropout. There can be used as a future progression. And second thing is in those patients who are having advanced glaucoma where the OCT RNFL is basically not very useful in that cases if you are seeing that there is a more dropout there then it is relevant otherwise OCT angiography is also not helping too much in our clinical things. I agree with the shortcomings but my question is it does not tell about the ocular blood flow in totality. I the think uh, since we have uh, exceeded our time yeah. I'll, we, can, we can continue the discussion at a later time so with just that, we conclude uh, this. Yeah. Question. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to understand we are talking about maximal uh, tolerated therapy. So, what would be the uh, percentage of patients who would need a triple therapy, a triple fixed dose combination to be added? Like, what do you, in your clinical practice, what do you think that? Uh, 
so ma'am actually see. the what is happening is if you can see the data also uh, the patients who are on the uh, who are because we are basically getting a referral practice so majority of our patients who are having advanced glaucoma or moderate glaucoma so they were they are using at least two drugs and we are seeing that maybe 10 years down the line whatever the data we are having right now out of them the 50% of the patients would be basically using a three drugs so that's why it makes a sense but how much would be the iop reduction uh, in long term studies whatever we have got in a triple short drug term. combination is a short term studies right now My, maybe 5 years down the line how much significant iop reduction more than two drugs would be there is still a question mark okay thank you thank you sir thank you very much thank you